Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Sorry about the delays. This is the first time we've tried to do this live broadcasting on the back patio, so thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome to our public lecture and stargazing event for March. Uh, my name's Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here and also organize these events. And there are, oh, I didn't grab a poster, but these occur once a month. They're open to everyone. They're, they're open to the public. They're free and sponsored by Caltech Astronomy and uh, the National Science Foundation. The, as you may have seen, up at the front door, we have our schedule of events for the remainder of the semester. The next one, I think, is April 12th on the Spitzer Space Telescope. In addition, we organize a number of other events, including Astronomy on Tap, which is also the schedule of Astronomy on Tap is on the back side of the flyer that you may have picked up. It, uh, these are events that take place at a local bar in Old Town, Pasadena, with informal talks, 15-minute talks on different astronomical topics, as well as uh, astronomy-themed pub trivia. That's also free, and it happens once a month on a Monday night. Our next one is a week, from, a week and a half from now on black holes and big numbers. So it should be awesome. Uh, tomorrow, there's a special event called Science for March that is occurring on the Beckman Lawn from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. It's kind of like a science fair with a bunch of different science booths that are, that are going on. You can, you can show up. It's open to everyone. Uh, the target is anything from K to 12 as well as adults. So there are science demos. We'll have a booth there where we're getting to use optics to light marshmallows on fire with the rays of the sun, which will be super cool. We'll also have a solar telescope so you can safely look at the, the surface of the sun. And then afterwards, there are a number of TED-style talks that are going on from 1 until 3 in the Beckman uh, Auditorium. And I'm giving one of those, too, so you should come and boo me, throw tomatoes. Uh, so tonight's schedule will have about a 30-minute lecture from our speaker. And then after a few questions, you guys are adjourned. We'll set up telescopes on the fields right behind us. So if you follow the signs out and into the north ath athletic fields, we'll have telescopes set up. Finally, we've got some clear weather we haven't had for the last three months. But there will be lots of good viewing. And at the same time that that's going on, that goes on until 10 o'clock. At the same time that's going on, we'll have a panel of, of experts in different areas of astrophysics and planetary science set up in here to answer your questions on whatever topic uh, you can think of. You can ask a question about space science or planetary science or astronomy or physics or whatever, and we'll do our best to, to answer. So, And feel free to go back and forth between in the auditorium and out stargazing if you want. And I think, oh, and the only other announcements are if you go on the fields, uh, there are all these rules, or else we get banished from the field. So no litter, no food, no drink, no smoking, no pets, and no high heels, interestingly enough, because it can puncture the artificial turf, and they'll banish us from the land. So uh, for those of you wearing high heels, it's really nice to take off your shoes anyway. Even if you aren't wearing high heels, you can take off your shoes, and it's really comfortable. So uh, please, I encourage you to remove your shoes so we, we can continue to use the fields. And I think those are all the announcements. So uh, our speaker for tonight, I'm honored to present, uh, is uh, he's a professor here, Dr. Mike Brown. He, um, he's been a, he did his uh, PhD at Princeton. No, his undergrad at Princeton, his PhD at Berkeley. And he's been a faculty member here in the Planetary Sciences Department since 1998. Uh, he, he gained a lot of notoriety. And his Twitter handle is called Pluto Killer because he... Uh, he played a significant role in the discovery of many other objects in the outer solar system in the Kuiper Belt that, that, that took away some of the shine of Pluto <laughs> and resulted in the demotion from planet to dwarf planet of Pluto. But he's going to talk tonight about Planet 9, the worthy successor to Pluto that's potentially much more massive, but we haven't yet detected it. So please welcome our speaker, Dr. Mike Brown. So it's, uh, it's great to see such a huge crowd out here. Um, I'm kind of amazed. Uh, did anybody follow my advice on Twitter and go and have dinner at Pine Burger before coming here? Anybody? One person. Okay, well, 
you know, I try to get my kickbacks from Pie and Burger, and they're not going to be very high tonight. But yeah, maybe next time around. So I'm I'm going to I'm not going to talk very much about the, the the old story of Pluto getting demoted, though I have to admit that it is impossible for me to give a talk without giving little subtle digs to Pluto at the same time. So you'll see them. I, I I'll admit. But we really are going to talk tonight about uh, this this new idea that there is a ninth planet, which I would not say is a worthy successor to Pluto. It's uh, so much more massive than Pluto that, that it would stomp on Pluto's head. Um, Pluto hardly exists. Uh, I'm going to tell you why we think it's out there, um, and I'm going to tell you uh, how, how we're trying to go about finding it and give you some idea of when we think we might find it. But to tell the story, uh, I, I really think it's important to step back and think about the discovery of planets in our solar system uh, and the, the history of predicting that there are new planets in our solar system. This goes back a long time. If you go back to about 1780, uh, in 1780, you could look up in the sky like a nice clear night like tonight, and you could see all the planets. All the planets were visible to the eye. Uh, they extended as far as Saturn, and that was, that was all there was. And as far as I can tell, I've gone back and tried to read old historic documents. As far as I can tell, people really never thought very much about the fact that there might be more planets out there to be found. Uh, the telescope had been invented. People were realizing that there were stars that they couldn't see without a telescope. People were realizing that there were things like Jupiter had moons that you couldn't see without a telescope. But there's no written speculation that there might be more planets to be found. And so. Uh, at this moment in time, uh, William Herschel had built what was the best telescope in the world. It made these very, very super crisp images. And he was simply cataloging the stars. He was, he was making a map. He would see a star. He'd write it down. He'd see a star, write its position, make a map of that. And because his telescope was so good, one night he was looking and he realized that something he saw was, was not a star. It was a little bit extended, a little bit fuzzy. And there are many things in the sky that are not little points of light like stars. There are things that we call planetary nebulae, or they're galaxies, or they're comets, or they're other things. So he didn't know what it was, but he, he, he noted that there was something strange there. And he was smart enough to go back and look the next day. When he went back and looked the next day, it was in a different spot. The second that you realize it's in a different spot, you, you instantly realize that this is not some nebula, some galaxy. They didn't know what galaxies were at the time, but it was not something external. This is something in our solar system. It's moving around the sun, and because, of its, because it's close and because it's moving, you can see that motion in the sky in one night. Herschel himself didn't really want to call it a planet. Uh, he said, you know, there's a thing. It's moving. Maybe it's a comet. Maybe it's something else. Everybody else uh, was was, was trying, to exp trying to convince him that he had discovered this new planet, but he was, he was reluctant just because I think it was the idea that there was a new planet it was just so hard to imagine. So fast forward uh, about 30 years, and people were still trying to answer the question, is it a planet or is it not? And, and to them, the way to answer the question of is it a planet or not depended on its orbit around the sun. Planets, as they all knew at the time, go in these nice circular orbits around the sun, the alternative was that it might be a comet. Comets, if you ever look at the orbit of a comet, they come in close to the sun and then go further out. And so the fact that it might have been out here could mean it's on its way back in and on its way out, or it could be on a circular orbit. They didn't have any way to find out. In 1820, a, an astronomer in Paris named uh, Alexis Bouvard, who has the best title ever. I, I need all these. Every time I write a paper, I'm going to use all these titles. Uh, Order of the Royal Legion of Honor, member of the Academy, Royal Sciences, Bureau of Longitudes. I actually know, I know a guy who's a member of the Bureau of Longitudes in Paris these days. It's, it's some honorific title. I, I need that one. Uh, <laughs> Academy Royal Sciences, uh, London, Society, uh, many, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So good. <laughs> but more importantly, he was, it's a tables, you know, the, the exciting title here, Tables of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And they were basically tables of where the planets were. And the reason that he wanted to know where the planets were is because he wanted to understand how they went around the sun and calculate how much, uh, if he could figure out where their positions were supposed to be. And what he realized, here's the, the, the key table on Uranus is right here. And I mean, it's astounding, right? Oh, wait. OK, so let me tell you why it's astounding. Um, first thing is, he, he does all this math over here to figure out exactly where Uranus should be. 
you know, we all know it goes in a circle around the sun. Now we know it. It goes in a circle around the sun, but it's not a, it's not a circle, really. It's an ellipse, really. And it's not even a perfect ellipse because Jupiter and Saturn tug on it a little bit. So sometimes it's a little faster and sometimes it's a little slower. And that's what all this math over here does. It figures out where precisely Uranus should be in the sky. And he did something really amazing. He went back in time. Here's the discovery of Uranus, 1782. Um, and he goes backwards in time, 1781, 1771, 69, all the way back to 1690. So you might ask how he figured out how to go backwards in time. Um, he found out that there were astronomers as early as 1690 who were cataloging stars. And they did two things that were not quite as good. They, they, they cataloged positions of stars. Their telescopes weren't as good, so they didn't notice that Uranus was fuzzy. And they never went back a second night to see if the stars had moved. So they just cataloged them one night, cataloged them the next night. And so in 1690, an astronomer actually found Uranus and thought it was a star and put it in the catalog. Uh, Bouvard went back, realized that, and realized that there's no star there and, and mapped its position all the way back to here. The interesting thing about this table from 1690 up to 1819 is that you see these pluses and minuses and pluses and pluses and minuses. Uh, the string of, of numbers. These are how far Uranus is away from where it's supposed to be. If, if his theory was perfect, these should all be zero. It's not perfect. They're actually fairly large numbers. And I don't know if any of you know any theoretical astrophysicists. Any, anybody have friends who's a theoretical astrophysicist? So you'll, you'll get it. If you, if you know these people, this is what they would say. Okay, clearly there are discrepancies here. Uh, my theory is perfect. It must be the bad observations. Those astronomers are terrible. <laughs> this continues to this day. Um, but he does say down here, there, yeah, there is all, there's an alternative, possibly, maybe also there's another planet out there that's pulling Uranus along in its orbit, uh, but probably not. Probably it's just bad data. You crummy astronomers do better and, and show that it's in the right spot. So the crummy astronomers... Um, observed Uranus for another 20 years, and it kept on being in the wrong place. And by about 1840, it was pretty well understood that there must be something else out there uh, beyond Uranus. Basically, Uranus would go along a little bit fast in its orbit for a while, a little bit slow, a little bit fast, and they realized it's because something else is pulling it along. Nobody knew how to do the math to figure out where it was, though, um, until Urbain Le Verrier, also working at the same uh, observatory, came along, um, developed an entirely new set of mathematics to try to predict where the planet was. He went to the uh, academy in Paris, presented his paper on all the mathematics of where this planet was, and they all clapped their hands. Very nice, very nice. Well done, well done. And he, um, I, I, he suggested that they go look for this planet, and they... No. <laughs> they did. So no, nobody wanted to, to really look for the planet um, because I think, this is, this is my interpretation of what was going on in 18, 1845, is that they, they really were not convinced. They, they, they liked his math. His math was beautiful and made a nice theory and all these numbers went to zero. Uh, but they didn't really think you could use math to predict planets. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, so they didn't want to go look. He, he eventually sent a telegram to Berlin uh, and got some astronomers in Berlin to go take a look at it. And they, in one night, they opened up the telescope, and it was right there. There was Neptune, the discovery of Neptune, uh, based on his predictions. He got really, really, really famous uh, overnight. There's a statue of him in Paris. Anybody seen this the statue of Le Verrier in Paris? Come on, what do you guys do when you go to Paris? I, I go visit. <laughs> I have a picture of myself right next to the statue of Le Verrier in Paris. Um, he got very, very famous, and astronomers immediately said, you know, I want to be famous. Uh, so they, they uh, decided to start predicting more planets. And so they tr kept on trying. Uh-oh. A, qu a quick announcement. We fixed the audio problems on the back patio, so now it should be working seamlessly. So if you want to go back out there instead of crow crowded in here, you can. Sorry for the brief interruption and the technical difficulties. Sorry for the back patio people. Hi, back patio people. Um, <laughs> We're talking about Neptune. Oh, up there. Hi, back patio people. Um, so what were we talking about? Neptune, Le Verrier, statues of Le Verrier, famous astronomers. Everybody wanted to be famous. Um, it took approximately 
three months before the next planet was predicted. Um, because people were like, okay, I can do the same math. The Verrier showed how you do the math, and they figured out that, well, these aren't actually zeros, and it doesn't exactly work, and so there must be yet another planet. And then it just kept going. From, from 1845 until uh, when we took count in about 2015, we, we have found something like 25 to 30 separate predictions of planets for some reason or another. Um, and it turns out um, every single one of these was wrong. Uh, until ours. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> every single one of these was wrong, and all for different reasons. Often the reasons that they were wrong was because the data were actually wrong. Um, the most famous of these comes from the prediction that, that many people know about, which is from Percival Lowell, who predicted what is now called Planet X. A lot of people think Planet X means just kind of anything out there. Planet X is an actual prediction by Percival Lowell of Pluto. Here's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. He didn't predict Pluto. He predicted a giant planet out here somewhere. And people went out and looked and found Pluto at the time and thought Pluto was Planet X when uh, it turned out uh, Pluto was not actually nearly big enough to be this thing that was the, the Planet X out there. And people spent decades looking for Planet X there's no Planet X. They realized that it was the data were bad. There's no evidence for Planet X. There's no evidence for any other of these planets that people were finding. And so by about 1992, uh, I was in graduate school in 1992, and I remember learning about this in 1992. In 1992, we learned that there absolutely positively are no planets, no, no planets beyond Neptune, and anybody who says there are is crazy. We learned that. And we also learned something... Uh, even more interesting is that though there aren't a lot of planets out there, there's a lot of stuff out beyond the orbit of Neptune. All these little objects that you see out here are things that astronomers have found out beyond Neptune in this region that these days we call the, the Kuiper Belt. Uh, they have orbits that look like this. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Um, they have orbits that look like this. They, they have crazy orbits like Pluto. They, they're tilted compared to everything else. And it's very clear, I mean, in the end, this is why Pluto ended up getting demoted. It's because Pluto is clearly a member of this vast population as opposed to being a member of, of these sorts of things like this. So that's, that's the location where Pluto fits. And so it was, it was fun to have found all these new objects. Um, and here's, let me just throw a few digs at Pluto just for fun. Um, just remember, here's the, here's the planets, their real sizes, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, huge Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. There's Pluto. It's really, really, really tiny. And not only is it really tiny, when we started finding these other objects in the Kuiper Belt, they, you know, they, they fill in the sizes there too. There's just a ton of things like Pluto out there. It really made no sense to call it a planet. But what it, what, when we found all of these objects out in the Kuiper Belt, one thing we realized is that we had yet another set of objects that we could look at the way they're perturbed and see if there's a new planet out there. It's just this obsession that astronomers seem to have. I don't know why they're so crazy, but we, we kept on looking. And, and most, for the most part, these objects in the Kuiper Belt seemed pretty, they, they were going where they were supposed to. They, they're, in, they're not in circular orbits, but they're pretty uniformly distributed around the sun. They're in this ring here. There was no hint in the early data that there was anything funny going on. The first hint of anything funny um, came in 2003 when we discovered this one crazy object. This crazy object goes way, way, way out there. It has a... Uh, it's about a 10,000 year orbit around the sun. Really, really uh, long. And it, it rarely even gets close to the sun. It's a, it's a bizarre object that uh, it took us a while. It, at the time, we knew it was strange. We didn't know how it got there. And we spent a lot of a decade trying to figure out how it got there and how objects like it formed. It took another 10 years after that discovery of Neptune to realize that something was funny was going on. We found other objects like Sedna, which go really far away from the sun and come back in. And the really strange thing about them that was totally unexpected is they all go off in one direction. And if you look at, actually that little blue circle is Neptune. I should, that's the orbit of Neptune. These are the orbits of all these objects. They all go off in one direction. And not only that, they're all tilted slightly with respect to the plane of the solar system. And they're all tilted in about the same direction. And it's really weird. They should not do that. If, you, if, if there was nothing keeping them in place like that over the course of just a blink of an eye, 100 million years, 
uh, they should uh, basically disperse randomly once again. So either there was something funny going on and we just got lucky and they happened to be lined up like that, or there was something even funnier going on and they were all lined up for one particular reason. So this, this is where uh, we started with our trying to develop the idea of what, what was going on out here. And when I say we, um, and I'll often say we on this, this is me and Constantine Batigan. Constantine is another professor of planetary science uh, across the street, and he has an, an office about three doors down from mine, and in this time period, uh, we wore out the carpeting between our two offices. We would just like walk back and forth and be like, did you see how, what is God doing? He's like, oh, it's not, and, and we would argue and people thought we hated each other because he would be like, what about this? I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And, and uh, but it was fun. We were having a great time. Um, and we tried everything we could think of because the one thing we did not want to stand up and say is, well, I guess it has to be a planet because that's dumb. And we, had, we knew that only dumb astronomers stand up and say, it must be a planet. And if, as soon as we stood up and said it must be a planet, people were just going to throw tomatoes at us. And so we tried every other possibility. And in the end, we couldn't make it work without a planet. So here's, here's the idea. The idea is you saw those objects. I should have shown you one here. You saw those objects all lined up like this. And our idea was if you had a planet like this with an orbit that kind of hugged the outside of all those, those uh, really distant Kuiper Belt objects, that it would kind of keep them from wandering. So we worked out the math. The, 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 I, I nicely say we worked out the math. Um, Constantine did all the math. Um, <laughs> it's OK. Um, and it all worked. And we thought, that's cute. But let's, let's do a, a computer simulation and see if it works. And I'm going to show you this computer simulation because um, it's entertaining. And here's, here's what I'm showing you. Uh, in pink right here, you can't see it all the way in here, is, is the, we, we place a planet, a, a massive planet on an eccentric orbit around the sun. The orbit of Neptune, you can't even see it, it's right there. So this is a huge region of the solar system. The Earth is right about there. Each one of these blue things is a random object that we put in, into a crazy orbit. So we can, do, we can do this all on the computer very easily. We just put all the objects in, we turn on gravity, we say go what happens. And we sit back and we wait four billion years. And hope you guys have a long time, because here we go, four billion years. Um, the first thing that happens is notice that a lot of these objects disappear. That's because they get too close to the planet, and they, the gravity of the planet flings them out of the solar system. Remember what we're looking for. We're looking for things that get trapped into orbits like this and stick around. The other thing that you notice is things that don't go very far, I'm highlighting them in green here, Nothing really happens to them. They just kind of, their orbits just kind of move around. The orbits change position. Nothing really happens. But these start to get captured over here, like this, like, like that one. No, this one, this one. This next one's going to do it. This one's, no. Okay, this one stays. <laughs> this next one, no, no. Uh, this one stays. This one's that. So none of them stay. Um, it didn't work at all, actually. Our computer simulations showed that our initial hypothesis was completely wrong. Planets do not do what we thought planets did, uh, but planets do something entirely different from what we first thought, which is that nothing is getting captured over here at all because they're all over here. These are the objects that are, this is four billion years later, this looks an awful lot like what we see in the solar system right now. Rather than a planet hugging everything and keeping it together, uh, they actually, it almost like it repels it. It doesn't actually repel it, but it almost looks like it's repelling it. At first we thought, this is ridiculous. There's no way this can be right. And then we thought, ah, we're idiots. This, this is obvious. We should have known this from begin with, to begin with. And, and it's just for the simple reason that the planet, this planet that we put here, is big and massive. And any time an object gets close to it, it gets ejected. If you had something, and, and, a, and planets, when they go around the sun, they, they, they go slowly out through here, and then they go fast. Slow, fast, like this. So it spends most of its time out here. And these do the same thing, slow, fast, slow. So imagine an object that was like this. It would spend most of its time here. The planet spends most of its time here. They're close together a lot of the time. That's bad news. It gets ejected. The only way to stay as far as possible from this planet is to actually be over here. You spend most of your time over here. It spends most of its time over here. You stick around. So a planet explains 
something like this if the planet is something like this. And the other thing that we found is that, remember how those objects are kind of tilted funny? As long as the planet is tilted in the same way, it all works out just perfectly. So this was, this was cute. Um, but it, I would say it was, a, it was a nice explanation. Explanations are actually pretty easy in astronomy. Um, you know, somebody shows you something weird and you can make up some story about why it happened. And this was a, this was a good story. It was, the physics works. But, it, but it, it was not enough for us to want to stand up and say, we think there's a planet out there. Because, again, for 170 years, people have been saying that. And they're always wrong and usually ridiculous. Um, we don't mind being wrong, but it's less fun to be ridiculous. And so we tried to think of, was there anything? It's, it's easy to make an explanation. What you really want in science is to make a prediction and have the prediction come true. And one very strong prediction that this theory had is that in addition to having these objects like this, the theory predicted that there should be another set of objects lined perpendicularly. So going this way and this way, and, and uh, I, it's, it's hard to picture it, but imagine the planets like this, all these objects are like this, and then a set of objects with orbits like this and like this. They almost look like wings of a, of a butterfly or something. Um, the theory predicted that very strongly, and there was, there was no way that they couldn't be there, and we had never seen them. And we, we actually, this was enough to make us sufficiently worried that we were about ready to throw away the entire theory and just think, okay, we're wrong. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. And one day we were sitting in my office, and I, I suddenly had this idea to look at this other set of collection of objects we had never looked at, uh, which was not smart on my part to have not looked at them. But when we did look at them, we realized that they were, in fact, exactly what I just described. These things are perpendicular, um, off in these, in these directions, in these directions, and perpendicular in this way. These are the objects that were predicted by our computer simulations that nobody had any explanation for otherwise. This is the point where to, to both of us were sitting in my office at this point and our, our jaws hit the ground. I, I think both of us had the same thought at the same time, which is, oh my God, this is, this is actually this is actually a planet. This is not just a cute theory that we just came up with. This is actually a planet out there, and we got to go find it. So this was the point at which uh, nearly three years ago now, uh, we wrote a paper. We, we wrote down our prediction, uh, uh, and the paper, paper was published about three years ago, and we made a couple of predictions. We made a prediction of where the planet should be, what it should be like, um, how we're going to find it, but we also said, look, if this is true, people will continue to find more objects in this direction. And, and it is still true that a few will be found in this direction, um, but there should be, most of them should be in this direction, only a couple in this direction, and more like this. So let's fast forward a few years. That was our prediction. Um, here's the original objects, one, two, three, four, five, six. A year later, there was a, a new one was found. They're hard to find, they don't come quickly. Um, three new ones were found, one, two, Finally, one in the wrong direction, which was good. I was getting worried that there weren't. There's a fourth one in, in the right direction. There are six more that are about to be published, all in the right direction, and one more going off in this direction. So it's something like 16 in one direction, two in the other direction. It's exactly what we predicted. Um, it's, it's gratifying. Every time I go and see a paper that says there's a new object off in this direction, I'm like, <laughs> yes, good. That's what I wanted to see. OK, so at this point, um, the data are so good, the predictions have all come true, um, the explanation is, is not even that crazy. I, I'm going to tell you, there's a planet out there. It's not, I, don't, I don't think that there's a question at this point. I think this is more or less like 1840 where everybody more or less knows there's a planet out there and now the trick is to predict where it is better so that we can go find it. So for the last three years, that's the main thing we've been doing, trying to predict where it is better so that we can go find it. So in doing that, predicting where it is better, we take those same sorts of computer simulations that I showed you one of. At this point, we now have about 3,000 of those. We actually have a, a cluster of computers in the basement of the building across the street from us that uh, has been sitting for two years nonstop running these simulations, trying to, to pinpoint exactly where it is. And we've learned a lot about where we need to be looking, and we've learned a lot about what that planet is. So the first thing that we learned is how big it is, how massive it is. So 
We detect it by its gravitational pull, which means that we're detecting it by its, by its mass. So how big is that mass? Well, three years ago, at first, we thought it was something like 10 times the mass of the Earth, um, which puts it comfortably between Earth, which is precisely one times the mass of the Earth, and um, <laughs> Neptune and Uranus, which are about 15 times the mass of the Earth. It's, it's actually an, an interesting um, mass because Five years ago, I, I would be, always be teaching my planetary science class again across the street, and I would always say, isn't it interesting that, in, in, that between one and about 15 Earth masses, we don't have any planets? But if you look at stars in our galaxy, something like 10 Earth masses is about the most common type of planet that there is out there. Isn't it weird we don't have one? Well, the answer is, it would be weird if we didn't have one, but we got one. There it is. Um, but it's not 10. Turns out uh, we now know better, and the answer is about six. Um, six plus or minus one. I mean, this is, we're getting to like real, real numbers and real uncertainty. So the, the, the mass is six times the mass of the Earth with an uncertainty of about one. Yeah, you could probably get away with eight if you had to, but, but about six. Six is a really interesting number. At 10, I was perfectly willing to say 10 is pretty close to Neptune and Uranus. And I, we, we had the artists draw these pictures and, and we said, make it look like Neptune and put some lightning on it for fun. Um, so that's, that's why that picture looks like that. Um, six is not, six is really kind of could go either direction. And, and around other stars, six Earth masses tends to be more like Neptune than like the Earth. But around other stars, the, the six Earth mass things that we see are really close to those stars, so they're hot. This is really far away, so it's cold. So I'm a little unsure what we're looking for. Let's just give you a little perspective here. Here was that picture I showed you again, uh, Uranus, Neptune, all the things in the Kuiper belt. Here's, here's how big it is if it's a kind of a Neptune-ish like planet. It's something like this, and it's also really probably quite bright like this. Um, if it's more like a giant version of, of a, an icy satellite like Ganymede, Jupiter's, uh, the biggest satellite in the solar system, Ganymede, a big ice ball. If it's more like that, then it's kind of like that big. Again, these are huge. That looks like a real planet, right? None of this garbage like down here. Um, but there's a, there's a big difference between this, which is bright and big, and this, which is darker and smaller. And that's that even though they're the same mass, one of them is a lot easier to find. This is a lot easier to find than this. And we don't know which one it is. So this is, this is a, a current source of frustration. The good news is we got telescopes. Um, uh, Caltech runs the two Keck telescopes on the summit of uh, Mauna Kea. You, uh, you can see Maui there in the background. And I love the Keck telescopes, um, and they are awful for trying to look for Planet Nine uh, because the Keck telescopes really have specialized in being super good at studying detailed things once you find them. They're not so good at looking at huge swaths of the sky looking for something new, but this telescope, uh, the Subaru telescope, is perfect for that. Um, the Subaru telescope is the Japanese national telescope. Um, Subaru, not because of the car. Um, anybody know Subaru in Japanese? It's the Pleiades, which you'll, you'll see tonight. Um, that's also why the Subaru logo is the Pleiades. Um, they also, and it's, I, I was wondering if they're trying to get like sponsorship out of the car company, but no, I don't think so. It's just the Subaru telescope has this great camera that is designed, it's, it's huge. There it is. Here's the, tel there's me and Constantine. Um, this is the Subaru telescope. This mirror is um, eight meters across. This is, uh, God, I don't even know. This is, this is about six stories, maybe? I think so. It's about six stories high. There's the camera. The camera sits at the top and is collecting all the light that comes in um, from the big mirror down here. It covers huge swaths of the sky at once. So that's great. It's a big telescope, big camera, and it will allow us to search vast regions of the sky for something that's very faint. There's also um, another telescope in this picture that you can't see because it's over here on top of Haleakala on, on the island of Maui. And it's called the Pan-STARRS telescope. It's been taking pictures of the skies, sky for six or seven years. It's a much smaller telescope, but it's covered a lot bigger region of the sky already. If Planet Nine is that big, bright thing, we're going to find it in data that already exists from Haleakala. If it's that small, dark thing, I think we're going to find it from this one over here. I'm working on both of these at the same time. Um, 
I'm driving driving me crazy. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna figure out which one it is. I think relatively soon. So let me show you uh, where I think it is in the sky, and I'm I'm pretty excited about this tonight because you're gonna go see it tonight, not Planet Nine. <laughs> you're gonna go see this spot in the sky because I mean it's all right. I always say this, but it's really true. If if you could name your favorite constellation, everybody just say out loud your favorite constellation. Ready, set, go. I heard a lot of Orions. I heard something else over here that I... Cygnus. Cygnus is good. Actually, Cygnus is great. We'll give you Cygnus soon. But I think I heard more Orions because I was looking, listening for that. So Orion, I mean, come on. And so Orion is, is uh, visible from everywhere on the Earth. Um, I read once that it's like the only constellation that is the same in, in all mythologies that people know about constellations. It's always a humanoid figure because it really looks like somebody up there in the sky doing something. It's a fantastic place. I mean, if, if I had to tell you that Planet Nine was in the constellation Cetus, uh, only three of you would even know what Cetus is. One? <laughs> it was one. Maybe only one of you. Cetus is a whale. Um, so it is my favorite spot in the sky. And, and you can see it tonight. You look straight up. There is Orion. Um, it's beautiful. Taurus is over here. And the cool thing, well, so Planet Nine is not there. But it's really close. Planet Nine, I think is in this swath of the sky right here. This swath of the sky right here is actually right between Orion and Taurus. Um, you know, the, the, the cosmic battle in the sky, Orion is either depicted usually with a bow um, shooting at the bull or a shield protecting himself um, from the bull. So there's this huge clash in the sky. And in the middle of this clash in the sky is, is Planet Nine. What I want you to do when you go out tonight is to stare at that spot in the sky for a minute and, and don't just think, wow, that was the best talk I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, <laughs> what I want you to think is, is there really is a planet out there. There's a planet out there that no one's found and it's just right there. I mean, I, I literally do this when I go outside and see Orion. I always just stop. I'm like, it is, I can feel it. It's right there. I mean, it really is right there. I want you to just spend a second seeing if you can feel it out there. Um, we've been searching. We, 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 uh, that's, I, I think it's right there, but I can't. <laughs> but it might not be. That's, this is our, in, in, the, in the statistics that we've done, this is the most likely spot, but it's not that much more likely than anywhere else in here. Uh, our first year we covered about this much. Last year we've covered uh, a little bit more. We're going to keep going. I, I don't want to uh, keep you guys here much longer because I want you to go and see it, but I do want to end with one thing that I started with. This is the poster, of course. We stole this fair and square from Plan 9 from Outer Space, which is famous. Why is it famous? Worst movie ever made. Um, I, I'm, this, is, this is not me. This is some critics association voted it as the worst movie ever made. Um, and it really is, I mean, it's, it's not even so bad that it's good. It's just bad. Um, so there are zombies. Um, there's Dracula. There's Vampira. Uh, this is Constantine, actually, strangely enough. Um, <laughs> And, and so it was, it, was, um, uh, it was filmed in 1959. Ed Wood was the director, and Ed Wood, I think, made this poster. 1959, if you think about what was happening in the solar system in 1959, um, Pluto had been discovered in 1930. Um, there was some argument about it, whether it was a planet or not, when it was discovered. Nobody knew what else to call it, so they called it a planet. But Ed Wood, in addition to being, um, you know, making this terrible, terrible, terrible movie, uh, was generally considered kind of a genius. And, and he was ahead of his time in many ways. And the one that I never realized until I started looking at this poster is, I mean, so see this graveyard scene right here? There's the two, the, there's, if you look at the tombstone, can anybody read that tombstone? No, no okay, let me, let, me, let me zoom that in. Um, Ed Wood, 1959. <laughs> Who knew? Who just knew? So th thanks for coming out. Please stick around for the... For the, for the stars, go see where Planet Nine is. It, Planet Nine right now is basically right there. Um, I'm not even joking. See the stars, hang out, talk to the astronomers. Uh, something else they're supposed to do. We'll have a panel Q&A. A panel Q&A and, and ask me questions. Thank you, Dr. Ben. I'll let, I'll let everybody uh, head out for a second, then we'll take questions for anybody who's still around. And I will take questions from the youngest person who raises his or her hand. <laughs> I, I think I got it. I think I got one. So, 
Do I have a percentage chance that there isn't a Planet Nine? That is a fabulous question. And a lot of the last three years, we've been, we've been spending trying to answer that precise question because we really want to know, is it, is it something that we just think is there or do we have, is, can we really do the, the probabilities correctly? And as of about three weeks ago, we finally had the analysis finished. The chance that there's not a Planet Nine is 0.2%. So it's one in 500. So... <coughs> I'd say yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any other any other youngsters? No youngsters? Okay, oldsters. <laughs> oh, such a good question. Is is something funny going on because planet 9 is being pulled along by a planet 10? and therefore we can't find it. Let me tell you, we worry about that a lot. Um, uh, like really a lot. Uh, we think that even if there is a planet 10, which there may well be, there's no reason there shouldn't be, but there's also no evidence that there is. We think that the effects that we're seeing um, from planet nine will be the same even if planet nine is being tugged around a little bit. But we're actually doing that analysis right now because, because we're worried about it. Yeah, we have not, there's nothing that we've seen that would lead us to say that there has to be another planet out there. What I think um, is that uh, if there is a planet even beyond planet nine, that the way that it would eventually be found is similar to how we found planet nine, which is realizing that there are distant objects being perturbed even more. And, and we don't have big enough telescopes yet. So I, I mean, I think planet nine is kind of perfectly suited for finding with the telescopes we have right now. I think that if there's a Planet 10, it's going to be up to you know, the kids here to go find that one. So we'll, we'll leave that one for you guys. Yeah. You can see it. It's behind the, it's behind the gate. Yeah. You can see I can, I, yeah. So I still go, I go up to the gate and kind of stick my face and go like... So, so it's a, it's a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that in an even more general way, which is, so there, there are a lot of different uh, big sets of data of things that have been taken in the sky, uh, pictures of the sky, measurements of different things in the sky. And a really interesting question is, is there anything in those data that we can use? Either is Planet Nine in those data or evidence for Planet Nine? And uh, we have, this is, we're looking at pan stars, as I said, so that's one of the similar set of things. So one of these um, uh, spacecraft missions is called Gaia, and Gaia has taken uh, measurements around the entire sky. It probably doesn't go faint enough to actually see Planet Nine itself, but there are people who have suggested that if Planet Nine is there, it might be able to see the perturbations of stars as Planet Nine, as the, the star light, not the stars themselves, but the star light. We can't do that yet because the current data release doesn't give us, um, give us that. But uh, maybe, that's going to be hard, um, but it would be awesome if it, if it worked out that way. That would be really cool. Let me, let me look back in the back because I can't see the back usually. I'm going to go way in the back. Yes. You're, no, yes, you. you. Oh, no, you can't tell me that. So, <laughs> so astronomers, I think it's fair to say, you can ask the other people around here. Astronomers, I think of as very superstitious people. Um, and... One of my superstitions, and I, I think it's actually because of we're so uh, dependent on the weather, that's at least where all my superstitions are from that I'm going to admit. Um, one of my very strong superstitions is, is that if you name it before you find it, you will not find it. There's one example that I can think of uh, that's a really good example, which is Leverrier, after finding Neptune, himself went into the business of predicting new planets, and he predicted this planet interior to Mercury called, and he named it Vulcan. <laughs> Doesn't exist, Le Verrier. So, I mean, it, he was, his, his was the interesting case where the data were good, uh, it's the physics were no good. His, the, this is, the reason he thought there was one inside of Mercury is actually because of general relativity. So it, we'll, we'll give him a pass on that one. He didn't know about general relativity. But still, he named it 
So no. And if you'd like to give me suggestions, just let me know so I can stick my fingers in my ears first. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yes. It was, Clyde Tombaugh passed away just a few years before Pluto got demoted. Uh, he, was, he was still alive when, they were, when, when the first Kuiper Belt object was discovered in 1992. Well, I would say he discovered the first Kuiper Belt object, but when the second Kuiper Belt object was discovered in 1992. And that's when the grumblings kind of started. So I think he was aware of the grumblings, um, but he didn't, he didn't live to see it demoted. Yes. What, what keeps all these planets in orbit? So the, um, the answer is always the same, which is the sun. The sun is, uh, is massive in the center of the solar system. Everything goes in orbit around the sun because of the pull of the gravity of, of the sun. So even planet nine, which is really far away, um, is still held very strongly in place by, by the sun. All those orbits that I showed you were going around the sun. The sun uh, I, I, I should have made this more clear if it wasn't clear. The sun was always at the very center of all those things I showed. So everything that I've been talking about is in orbit around the sun and then being perturbed by something else at the same time. Go way back here. Yeah, did anybody go to the 7 o'clock talk? Yeah, you can answer this question for me. I didn't, I didn't make it. Right. Why, why, can it, why can you find these really distant planets and not find one in our own backyard? Um, and it's, it's actually, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And the, the answer is, if you want to find a planet around a star, where should you look? A star. Um, we know where the stars are. We know where the nearby stars are. We know where the bright stars are. That's where they're being found. So if I wanted to find a planet, if I wanted to find a star with a planet, I'd probably just go outside and point at the first star I see, and it probably has a planet, and I could probably find a planet around it. Um, but in... If you wanted to find one planet in our solar system that we don't know about, you have the whole sky to look for. So it's a lot harder. Those, those guys have it easy. <laughs> Cheaters, I say. That's what they are. Down front. What range of magnitudes do you predict? Yeah, so it's a good question, which is how, how bright is Planet 9 supposed to be? And the answer is different depending on whether it's that large, um, very bright, uh, Neptune-y kind of thing or the darker red uh, icy thing. Um, if it's the Neptune-y thing, it's like 20th, 20th magnitude, 21st magnitude. So for astronomers out there, so for, for maybe backyard astronomers, that might seem faint or something. But for the, for the astronomers out there, that's like super bright. It's, it's almost embarrassingly bright. It's, it's so bright that it must be in data from the past. And we must be able to track it down. That's if it's on the bright end. If it's on the faint end, it could be as faint as 24th magnitude, which is pretty faint. And so that's why we're using the Subaru for that. So it's in this weird range of really easy or really hard, or somewhere in between, which is a stupid range to me. In. Ooh, over on the side. How far away is planet nine? I, I didn't even show, say that. I, I showed the pictures. It's, it's about three times further than Neptune. So Neptune is, in the units that we use in the solar system, is astronomical units. Astronomical unit is. Uh, the distance from the sun to the earth is one, and Neptune is at 30, and planet nine is at 300. 310 plus or minus 20. That's actually the semi-major axis, so that's the average distance. So it, it's right now, it's probably at 400 at its most distance, distant, and it comes into about 280, so it's on that eccentric orbit. So we'll call it 480. Yes? Yeah, so because I'm not very smart, I think is the answer. Um, so we can detect its mass. Why can't we detect its location? Even better, you know, Leverrier predicted where Neptune was in one night. So what's wrong with me? Um, and the answer is, is subtle, but it's important, which is Leverrier predicted the location of Neptune by taking Uranus and looking at its a, a full orbit and saying, it's a little slow here, a little slow, speeds up over here. Aha, that must mean that Neptune is here. So he could do it that way. We don't have the luxury of having a full orbit of any of these objects. They, have, they take 100,000 years 
10,000 years to go around the sun. If you gave me 10,000 years and I could track one of these objects, I could pinpoint precisely where planet nine was. So instead, we have a ton of objects that are making a pattern in the sky that we're trying to match to theories of, of, of where it should be. And it's, it's just, it's harder to get it precise. We've narrowed the, the area down pretty, a lot, not quite a lot enough yet. Uh, every, you know, every minute that we wait and the computers across the street are churning, I think we narrow it down a little bit more. So I'm, I'm convinced we're going to find it soon, but I'm, Today I'm optimistic. Tomorrow I might say, we're never going to find it. <laughs> Not sure. Yes. I, I can, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Do you believe that planet X has a very eccentric So I don't believe that planet X exists. As I said, planet X is the thing that Clyde Tom, uh, that Percival Lowell predicted that he thought was perturbing Uranus and Neptune. Um, Planet Nine is not Planet X. They are entirely different things. Uh, people get confused and call it Planet X or call everything Planet X. But there really was a prediction of Planet X. This is a different thing. So I'll answer the real question you asked, which is, do I think that Planet Nine has an eccentric and inclined orbit? It has to. So the eccentricity is required to cluster all those other objects in the other direction. If it were not eccentric, it wouldn't do that. And the tilt of Planet Nine's orbit is required to make all those other objects tilted too. So we can read those patterns and try to determine exactly how planet nine is tilted. In fact, I will tell you right now, it is tilted by 17 degrees plus or minus three. And its eccentricity is 0.2 plus or minus 0.05. Don't write that down. <laughs> Nobody go find it. Uh, yes. So, so the question is, is it, is it possible that rather than a planet, that it's maybe a pair of things orbiting each other? So I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. Um, one is, gravitationally, yes, it is absolutely possible um, because all we detect is that there's a gravitational pull. And we don't know if it's two things. We don't know if it's a planet. We don't know what it's made out of. I mean, it, we know that there has to be six Earth masses. There could be six Earth masses of hamburgers, and it would still work. Um, in terms of the physics. In terms of the sort of uh, conceptual planetary science, it kind of doesn't make any sense. There's no, I mean, yes, it could be, but why? We don't, we've never seen anything like that in our solar system around any other star. And so it's kind of a weird, unnatural hypothesis. Earth and the moon is not much different. Uh, Earth and the moon is not much different. They're pretty different. And it would, be, it would be hard to have, I mean, if, if it were just two things that are about the same size, we could still find them. It wouldn't be that much harder to find these two different things because they would still just look like one big blob of light to us. It's just, it's, it's, it's not impossible. I mean, there's no reason that that can't work. Um, I don't think it's very likely is, is all. All right, I'm going to go all the way in the back. Can, can, can the computer simulations rule out a Planet 10? Absolutely not. Um, at this point, um, we could put a lot of stuff out there and not yet see the effects. If you, if you found another hundred of these distant objects, you might be able to start to do that. But right now, there could be a lot that we don't know still to come out there, which is kind of fun. I started this back at the beginning talking about in 1992 when I was in graduate school and the idea that there was a new planet was ridiculous. Um, and even if you would ask me, in fact, people asked me back when Pluto was demoted, will there ever be another planet found? And I was like, no, this is it, eight planets. And I was a little sad, I have to say, a little sad. Um, and now it's pretty cool. Yeah, I am, I am completely convinced there's a nine, and we don't know what else is out there. There's still plenty of the solar system left to find, which I think is a, a lot more fun than when we just had eight and that was all there was. Um, anybody who has a question that has not asked one, if you've asked one, Wait and see if I get and, that. And but just, I think we have to, just one more question. Okay, I already pointed that way. I, I, I pointed on the wall, sorry. Oh, that's a good question. Where did it come from? Why is there a planet nine in a crazy orbit out there? Um, so we don't know. 
the, 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 the fact that we see the gravitational pull tells us nothing about how it got there. But we can, we can uh, come up with hypotheses that I think are reasonable and, and, and even not very controversial. I think the most likely hypothesis is that it formed in the same region of, of the solar system as Uranus and Neptune back four and a half billion years ago. And as these things were all forming, um, having three planets that close together is, is, uh, is a little bit unstable. And so it probably came a little bit, it got flung inward close to maybe Saturn or Jupiter and got flung outward and has been kind of lurking at the edge of the solar system ever since then. That's such, a, such an uncontroversial idea that, that Constantine and I actually wrote a paper about that when he was in graduate school. Um, but we didn't, we didn't talk about Planet Nine being out there. We talked about what would happen if there were a fifth giant planet, what would happen, and we showed that we get ejected, and then that's all we did. And then, you know, a decade later, we're like, oh yeah, that, that's, oh yeah. Then it goes here, oh yeah. So I, I think that's likely, it's not, it doesn't have to be that. It, there are ways that it could have actually formed out there. I don't think it's true, but there are ways to make it happen. And it's also ways that we could have stolen it from another star. I don't think that's true either, but because we live here in LA, uh, I have been approached by at least one uh, producer who wants to make a movie where Planet Nine is stolen from a nearby star and it had a moon with a civilization on it that then goes extinct. It's, it's a long story. It's going to be good, though, when it comes out. Top notch. I hope to. I, I, I hope, yeah, I hope you guys are all there for it. Let's, let's thank our speaker. So, the members of our panel, uh, Cecilia Sanders is a graduate, a PhD student in Planetary Sciences Department, and she's happy to answer questions related to astrobiology, life on Earth and beyond, uh, geochemistry, and figuring out the ages of very old things. Uh, we've also got Nicole Wallach. Yes, I pronounced it okay, awesome. Also a PhD student in the Planetary Sciences Department, who's happy to answer questions about exoplanets, that is planets orbiting around other stars, planet formation, and how to use really big telescopes. We've got Catherine Plant, who is a graduate student in the astronomy and physics department, uh, happy to answer questions about building radio telescopes, fast radio bursts, which are these distant flashes of radio waves that come from some unknown objects, uh, and cosmic rays, oh yeah, things that make really short flashes of radio waves. And then I'm uh, Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a postdoc. I do research in galaxy evolution, so I can, I can try and fill in the cracks where, where we, we get questions on, on things unrelated to that. So, uh, yeah, so we open the floor up to questions from all of you. Yeah, so the question was whether or not astrobiology takes uh, inspiration from or shares uh, resources and ideas and things with the field of paleontology, um, which is an excellent question for me because secretly I am not in planetary science but in geobiology and planetary science. Um, so my day-to-day -day life, I am more, much more of a paleontologist um, than uh, or more closer to the spectrum of paleontology earth science, studying history of life on Earth, than I am to observational astronomy. Um, but I got into that because of my interest in astrobiology. So um, as it turns out, if you want to look for life in the universe, one of the best places to start is looking at the only confirmed world where we know life evolved, uh, which is our own. Which is our own. Um, so a lot of the tools that we use for understanding the history of life on Earth are the same tools that we, the same tools that we take with us when we go to Mars, um, and eventually when we go to Europa, um, potentially one day outside of our own solar system. Um, looking for life in the deep past of Earth is actually extremely difficult. Um, as you might imagine, if you leave a living thing that has, that has died and is decaying uh, just sitting out on a hot sidewalk in the middle of a hot day in summer in Los Angeles, uh, it will slowly degrade. It will slowly be eaten by a number of things. Its carbon will go back into the terrestrial carbon cycle. Um, and very little 
will be left behind to be potentially fossilized or preserved in the geochemical record and things like that. So paleontologists uh, work very hard to figure out uh, the rate at which those various processes happen, um, what are the circumstances under which those processes are stalled. Um, and even when those processes happen, is there any signature, uh, physical um, or chemical, that the living thing might have left behind that might survive for hundreds of millions of years beyond to be discovered by a paleontologist? So those questions are still very relevant on other planetary surfaces. And so uh, long answer to uh, a short but excellent question, uh, paleontology uh, is astrobiology. Um, but just applied to a slightly different, slightly different rock. Yeah. So the the question was. Um, well, the premise of your of your very excellent question is that the moon Enceladus, which is one of the many moons of the planet Saturn, has these huge, spectacular geysers um, that um, shoot off into space um, and are responsible for the production of the E-ring um, around the planet Saturn. So you have this huge ring of ice crystals and uh, sometimes colloidal silica, apparently, um, and other interesting things that are sourced um, from the subsurface of the moon Enceladus. Um, and so this is obviously of great interest to um, planetary scientists because it tells an interesting story about just how icy worlds form and evolve and the uh, physics and chemistry of cryovolcanism. Um, but it's also of great interest to astrobiologists because um, these geysers are associated with a temperature anomaly, a hot spot um, uh, in the southern hemisphere of Enceladus. And so explanations for that hot spot um, can be as simple as, oh, it's, it's tidal flexing. Um, because it's a small moon around a very big, massive planet, uh, it's just getting pushed and pulled around and it's developed and that heat uh, is being dissipated uh, in the ice shell and um, it's a way of melting the ice and making this water, and you know that's all very exciting. Um, but it's not specific enough, really, for scientists. So it's actually a big mystery. Uh, are can it get hot enough in there to have uh, hydrothermal systems of the kinds that we know support life on our own planet? So this is all premise. Enceladus, super interesting um, geyser systems, possible hydrothermal activity, all this stuff. But your question was, is anything like that happening on? other water ice moons, um, water ice dominated moons in our solar system like Europa. Um, and the answer, as far as I know, is no. Um, we have not observed, uh, we have not observed plumes of uh, nearly that magnitude um, on any other body uh, in the sol any other body in the solar system. Um, and uh, Earth included, we don't have giant plumes that spread into space, but New, thi new developments are happening all the time, and you know I'm not directly familiar with the most recent work on Europa. Um, a little bit. So there's some tentative evidence for some plumes on Europa, depending on who you ask, mostly. Uh, so I think there was some Hubble data that showed some possible tentative detection, but nothing to the extent of Enceladus. So I think these sorts of outer bodies are just super interesting to what we know to happen on these icy worlds and what we don't know. So worlds that we think should have plumes, we don't necessarily know if they're going to have plumes and things like that. So I think it just kind of speaks volumes to how little we really know about these sort of outer bodies in general. Yeah, it, it really does depend on who you ask, how much you believe it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was about the Hubble, the Hubble data that showed the possible plume on, on Europa. And it's still up for debate. And that's actually a really big thing in most of planetary science is that everything is kind of up for debate. And we don't know as much as we wish we knew about our own solar system. And like uh, Mike Brown alluded to before, sometimes we know a lot more about exoplanets or about things that are outside of the solar system. 
And it's kind of scary in a lot of ways, but it's kind of, look how much we have to look out to, basically, and look how much we have left to learn about our own world. So. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm sorry. How are you doing, Cameron? <laughs> It's actually not the innermost that's B, and yes, A is the star. Uh, and also, if there's a binary system, it's A, B then. But the lowercase letters are in the order in which they're discovered. So that's why you sometimes have planets that are discovered in sort of the wrong order, you'd think. Um, but it just so happens that the closer in planets tend to be easier to find. So that's why you do tend to have you know, B, C, D, E out. But it is just the order in which they were discovered. Is A is capital? They're always capital. Um, so yeah, the star is going to be capital letters. So if there's a, a binary system or a triple star system, it'll be A B C if it's surrounding all of those, which is a whole other series of problems. But no, it would just get a little confusing to have you know hat P twenty six A A. So hey. <laughs> Yeah, so the, for anyone who didn't hear the question, the question was, how do you know life when you see it? Um, and this can be as philosophical or as scientific a question uh, as anyone likes. And there are a lot of different opinions about what constitutes life. So um, one of the first things that you do when you first start learning about astrobiology as a field is just try to answer the question, what is life? Um, and there are a lot of possible definitions. Um, the one that I feel I subscribe the most to is uh, life is something that is not only uh, not only capable of uh, sustaining disequilibrium chemical conditions, <laughs> um, as some uh, astrobiologists who come more from the astronomy side uh, prefer to think of it. Um, I think that you need to add that additional layer of complexity that life can uh, make a plan for itself and perpetuate that plan. There has to be some uh, dimension of heredity and self-replication in order to really be life as we know it and think about it on our own world. Um, but that said, uh, that definition doesn't exclude things like viruses. That uh, definition doesn't necessarily exclude things uh, like um, like dormant spores or egg cells and things like that. Um, so, yeah. So, first part of that question is like w establishing what is life to begin with um, before we go looking for it. And then another dimension of that is um, maybe it's not enough to just say, do we find something that's capable of sustaining chemical disequilibria and making plans and uh, expressing uh, itself multiple, multiple times, it might just be simple enough to say life is a cell, you know, and then start to, and then start to talk about, well, what's inside of a cell? What are the uh, fundamental structures um, that define or make up a cell and that sort of thing? So when we talk about detecting life on this uh, or other worlds um, in the modern um, or in deep time, we're usually looking for some evidence of cellular uh, metabolism. And so metabolism is both uh, how you make energy, uh, how you make usable energy for yourself, and how you use that energy to assemble structures. Um, so in our case, assemble biomolecules, uh, proteins, and uh, nucleic acids, and that sort of thing. Um, of course, exactly what those uh, proteins and nucleic acids and carbohydrates and such look like in other organisms is certainly up for debate. So uh, looking for life on another world involves looking for, uh, you know, first you look at where energy might be available, um, might be available to something like a cell, um, and then how uh, 
how favorable um, kinetically and thermodynamically uh, are those reactions that might supply energy to the cell. Um, and then think about if the cell was using, uh, was using those energy sources, um, what would it leave behind? Um, is it depleting something? Is it enriching something? Is it, um, is it leaving a physical imprint of itself? Um, or, you know, my favorite, my favorite instance of the preservation of life is does it leave a fossil? You know, so leaving a physical structure behind is a kind of the gold standard um, for like discovering life on a discovering life on another world. Because as you might imagine, there are various ways of assembling certain structures or uh, depleting certain reservoirs and enriching other reservoirs of uh, a particular isotope or a particular compound or something like that that might not necessarily involve life. So having like a physical structure that can't be assembled um, in the absence of cellular metabolism is another, that's so the best. <laughs> the, uh, the Europa, Yeah. So what I would like to see as a proof of extant life on Europa, which is to say life that uh, is currently living today and not necessarily evidence of some uh, ancient extinct biosphere, um, I would want to see, I would probably want to see lipid, uh, lipid biomarkers. Um, so lipids are another type of uh, complex biomolecule that we make. Um, it's essential to the formation of all of our cells. Every single cell in your body is made up of uh, lipids. Um, and is that essential for, for the single cell in your body? Yes. Complex? Yeah. So every cell requires... Uh, so one of, one of the... This gets back to what is the definition of life. So one of the conditions um, for being a living thing is being somewhat compartmentalized, um, so separated from your environment and maintaining uh, homeostasis in the face of a changing environment. So if you are a, so one of the best ways of sort of encapsulating yourself um, is by building a lipid membrane. Um, so that membrane can take many forms, it can develop like structural complexities and things, but um, every living thing um, on earth, every cell, uh, makes a lipid membrane. And so, but it's not just the membrane. Um, lipids are also extremely useful for building structures inside of the cell, um, extremely useful um, as uh, secretions that help communicate between multiple cells in a community. It's another interesting hallmark of life on our planet is that it interacts with other life in interesting, complicated ways. And so lipids are just special in this context because they are a lot more resilient um, to the test of time. Um, and uh, there's such a variety of lipid structures that you can actually, if you find certain, uh, if you find certain lipids in the dirt or inside of an ancient organic rich shale um, or floating in uh, seawater, then certain lipids, their structure is impossible to accomplish um, without um, certain cellular machinery of assem for assembly. Um, and so you can actually distinguish between uh, different organisms, different metabolic strategies by what lipids they leave behind. So it's a, uh, it would be, so if, if there is extant life on, uh, in the oceans of Europa, that would be one of the best things to look for. That would be the most definitive. Um, finding actual cells um, would also be great, um, but is potentially uh, harder to, uh, if you were going to look for actual cells with some of the tools that we send to other planetary surfaces, um, you would still be looking for lipids. Um, so whether those lipids are assembled into a membrane or, or a different structure, or whether uh, those lipids are floating free on their own because the cell that made them has lysed and died. Um, what you would do is you'd probably put like a uh, flow cytometer or something like that uh, on your on your instrument so you could look uh, through the water, uh, look through the water that the instrument is floating through. Uh, 
and analyze it for those particular structures. So lipid biomarkers uh, would be my answer. Um, if you could get a look at the sedimentary geologic record of Europa, um, which I'm not so sure that such a thing exists, um, but uh, if you could, then there's a bunch of other interesting sedimentary structures that are um, indicative of microbial life. Um, as you might imagine, if you've, ever, if you've ever had a fish tank or looked in a pond or a puddle or something, like you, there's that kind of slimy stuff that grows on the sides or on, sometimes is a skim on the surface of the water. Microorganisms like to form these uh, biofilms um, or even assemble them into thick mats. Um, and those mats provide a cohesiveness that is difficult to achieve with just uh, mineral substrates alone. So you could potentially look at the rocks, um, look at sedimentary rocks deep beneath the ocean on Europa. It's more of a favorite, uh, a favorite activity um, for search for life on planets like Mars and stuff. I'm sorry, I can talk about this all night. So <laughs> we should probably move on to... Uh, Yes, yes. So, so lipids are fats. So is it, but is this, are fats being, I guess, is that a broader category than I guess maybe one might have an understanding of it? That deep earth is just working into that? Yeah, so. Does it exist even in like algae and uh, you know, other mineral? Yeah. Yeah, so biologists uh, slash biochemists um, will typically talk about. Um, Life, we talk about the, the building blocks for life. Um, the building blocks for life are these um, different classes of biomolecule. And so the classes classically are lipids, carbohydrates, um, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, and the differences between those are um, structural. Probably the best way the best way to define them would be to just draw the structure on the board, but since People didn't necessarily come for a biochemistry lecture. I won't do that, but um, it's it's very easy to look up. Um, and the uh, you know so what, when we think of um, dietary or nutritional like proteins and fats and things like that, technically they are the things that we're talking about fall under those categories of biomolecule. Um, but certainly, uh, the range of proteins that exist. Um, in nature is much, much larger than the range of proteins that are important for building our own, um, our own biomass, our own biological structures and things. So lipid does mean the same thing as, as fat, um, but dietary fat, as we think of it, is um, just a small subset of that much larger uh, group of biomolecules. And, you know, they, some of, your, some of our intuition that comes from our definition of like dietary fat is uh, does apply to lipids as well. Um, the way that it is sort of hydrophobic um, doesn't necessarily mix or dissolve in water that easily. Like that is a property of like of all lipids, that sort of thing. So sorry, I just started throwing out jargon <laughs> and did not explain it. But thank you for your question. Um, there's a gentleman who's been waiting very patiently in the back. Yeah. If you had a plan like Earth, if that's like Earth revolving around a red star, what would the color of the floor be? Yeah, so I think you're you're absolutely spot on. If we had a planet very much like Earth, that was would it be anything like we as humans would be familiar with, uh, with based on Yeah. Oh man, yeah. So what would the question is what would alien life be like on an Earth orbiting a star of a different color than our own? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of differences that um, we could possibly imagine if it was exactly like Earth in every way and the history of life, the evolution of land plants, if all of that happened in the exact, in the exact same way, um, yeah, you would still get up to a point where just fundamentally the, the photosynthetic organisms, so organisms that derive 
um, their energy ultimately from the sun, but then use that energy to assemble their own biomass independently. They do not consume uh, their reduced carbon from other organisms. Those photosynthetic organisms would have to be uh, sensitive to a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our sun uh, has a broad spectrum emission, but it is brightest um, in that yellow green part of the spectrum. And so if you are around a red dwarf star, um, that, brought that spectrum, that peak would be shifted a little bit um, to longer wavelengths, to lower energy wavelengths. So, um, so certainly, like, the plants would end up looking a different color because they're, um, the pigments that they use to harvest, to collect in light energy and turn that into usable chemical energy um, would be sensitive to a different, uh, to that different part of the spectrum. Yeah. That's... If you gave too much red to a red star, too much heat energy, so they probably be blocking out, so they're probably going to have red plant life, like or something. Yeah. Yeah, so that's certainly a very, a very interesting possibility. And almost more likely, I think, is that um, plant life just would not evolve the way that we understand it ourselves. Like, photosynthesis on land is already a wildly cool and improbable metabolic strategy. Photosynthesis is a strategy that evolved in marine, envir in marine environments on a planet around a yellow star. So I think that... Um, you know, certainly it could change the colors of the plants, but I think I would expect, uh, I think that I would expect uh, like non-oxygenic photosynthesis, um, which often uses uh, pigments that are sensitive to this different uh, set, uh, this different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, I think those organisms would do much better um, than the organisms that eventually became the land plants on our own world. So more likely than not, I think that life around a red planet, sorry, a red star, um, is probably gonna look a little bit more like the pond scum uh, around the like... Galaxy, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the most abundant star that you have are these smaller, redder stars. So it's important to note, though, that I don't usually come at this from a life perspective, um, so leave that to Cecilia, but there are other factors that will influence the ability in general for life to evolve on these types of planets around these stars. And one is that, you, as you alluded to before, they're much smaller and they're cooler. So you're going to have a habitable zone, a place where liquid water could be present on the surface of a planet, a lot closer in. There are a number of other factors also for these types of systems. Uh, things like availability of solids in the prenatal disk just means the building blocks for planets around stars like that. Uh, the age of these stars are very different, the time that they've had to evolve, planets and life to evolve around these stars. So I think that there's a lot of things to consider uh, when you're talking about planets around these, the most abundant of all stars. So. Including radiation environment. That's another interesting thing about, uh, sorry, another interesting thing about red dwarfs um, as well is that they, um, planets in this closer in habitable zone being the zone that's capable, uh, that's warm enough to support liquid water at the surface given a range of atmospheric compositions. Um, that zone is also subject to a much higher energy radiation environment than our own world is necessarily. Um, and our sort of pop culture intuition is correct that if you're getting bathed in higher energy radiation all the time, uh, it's a lot harder to maintain your nucleic acids, uh, the DNA, the RNA that are responsible for transferring, uh, for encoding all the things that a living thing needs to do. Uh, so maybe you don't evolve life at the surface at all, and maybe life ends up hanging out in the uh, immediate subsurface, in the soil, and the rock, um, uh, beneath the particular critical zone of the water column. Um, though not as deep as you might think, because water, indeed, uh, is uh, the penetration depth of this uh, longer wavelength, lower energy light is also uh, much shorter um, in water than on our, our own planet. So this, in addition to leading to interesting uh, variations in the type of life you might expect um, between, from planet to planet around different types of stars, um, leads to complications for the detection of life around those planets. If it's all gonna be underground, um, and maybe there's a lot, a lot of the things that we think of as being uh, 
atmospheric biomarkers around other stars like methane or oxygen or something like that. Maybe there's just a lot more, uh, maybe all of that is getting broken down and recycled in that you know, few meters of uh, rock in topsoil and maybe it's not making it into the atmosphere um, for us to detect it. So, quick side note on that. Yeah. So yeah, just a, a quick side note on that. Um, so when you hear about biosignatures, or for those of you who don't know, it's basically something that we'd assume would generate life, like would have generated by life rather. So things like oxygen that we expect be due to you know plants producing oxygen, uh, things like that that would be present in the atmosphere of a planet. So it's important when you hear in pop science or in you know on the news somewhere, it's like oh we detect biosignatures. That doesn't necessarily mean there's life there. Just an important caveat to you know pop science is that. We don't really understand everything about atmospheres of planets, and there's a lot of confounding variables when you're talking about atmospheric biosignatures. So, you know, chemistry produces a lot of these things. Chemistry produces methane and CO2 and oxygen, just, you know, the planet being around its star and it being hot. So just, you know. Exactly. So we actually have no idea when we're talking about, you know, an Earth twin. It's like, this is the most Earth-like planet we've ever found. Most of the time, that's kind of nonsense when you think about it, because it could be a planet that's the same mass and radius as the Earth. We know nothing about its atmosphere most of the time for these types of planets. And even if we did, the likelihood of it being very similar to Earth, given how close they are to their host stars for most of the planets that have been detected in the ways that we're talking about when we're talking about Earth twins, it doesn't really lend itself to being able to be studied in the way that we would need to in order to actually detect life on another planet. So just, you know, important caveat to all of that. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on what your idea of life is, is a big thing. So according to what we know about the Earth, yeah. But we have a sample size of one, basically. So we know that given our conditions, at this very moment, we have been able to form life on this planet and a diversity of life, an amazing diversity of life. But we don't really know what life will take in different, what kind of forms life will take in other places. It could absolutely be like Star Trek and you could have silicon-based life forms. You don't know, we have absolutely no idea. The astrobiologist is now gonna be the pessimist. Um, not on silicon-based life, but uh, the, just to like clarify um, for anyone in the audience who hasn't heard this idea before, um, there's obviously a lot that life needs, not just water, um, not just an atmosphere of the particular composition that we've got, um, but also it turns out that life might require a planet with a uh, geodynamo, a planet that has a uh, molten, a, uh, a dynamic interior um, where you have, um, where you have uh, electrons that are being uh, cycled in such a way that they are generating a magnetic field, and that magnetic field extends wide enough around the planet to encompass uh, its atmosphere, so the gases that it's capable of holding onto um, because of its innate gravity. And so if you don't have an active geodynamo, um, for example, on Mars, um, which is a planet that is, uh, it doesn't look all that much smaller than Earth, but it's critically smaller than Earth, um, and it's uh, the differentiation of its core and its mantle and its crust um, proceeded in a different way. And so its interior um, doesn't have that same uh, flux of electrons going, ar going around and generating a magnetic field. So its magnetic field is much weaker and is part of the reason, combined with the fact that it's smaller, that it wasn't able to hold on to nearly as robust an atmosphere as the Earth has. So doesn't mean that life can't be there. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, many forms of life on our own planet do not necessarily have to interact directly um, with an atmosphere with nitrogen and oxygen um, in significant abundance. But it does, it does add this other caveat that if you see a planet that's just a little bit smaller than Earth, um, you're probably not going to see any Earth-like uh, you're not, probably not going to see the kinds of uh, interesting macro flora and fauna um, that we have on our own world. So uh, one way that people are interested in testing uh, and looking for planets that have magnetic fields is by looking for the aurora, like the 
the northern lights or southern lights uh, but looking for that around other stars because the uh, charged particles from a star's space weather when it hits an atmosphere with a magnetic field you get bright auroral emission and uh, this would be very faint for many planets except in extreme space weather events but if you look around enough stars and enough planets you might be able to detect it and uh, not yet so far it's it's required building a special dedicated array which is uh, built about uh, four hours north of here and they're still looking Yes, there's a telescope okay. looking for it. You mean the outside of the solar system? Are there other solar systems Yes, oh, uh, Jupiter auroras have been observed for sure, and a viewed from a distant star, Jupiter would be much easier to see in its auroral emission than Earth. And actually, uh, there was a public lecture here given about three years ago that was all about aurora around other planets in the solar system and it's on YouTube so if you look on our YouTube page Caltech Astro you can find uh, this lecture that's all about ma planetary magnetic fields throughout the solar system and their aurora but you're right it's Jupiter's the primary one So you're asking how how could radio telescopes be used to look for extraterrestrial no, Yes, I think uh, some things that could be distinctive would be something that confines a lot of energy to a very, very uh, specific frequency range. And people who work on this come up with uh, all kinds of ways for looking for really unusual signals. And uh, that's what, what I like best about those efforts is they come up with these signal processing algorithms that lets us find weird stuff and then we go and find weird stuff and it turns out to be new physical phenomena and scenarios to go look for. And uh, the discovery of pulsars is an example of that. There was this regular flash of radio emission coming periodically, as periodic as a clock. And at first, uh, when Jocelyn Bell found this, uh, people thought maybe it is aliens. What else could make flashes as regular as a clock and it turned out it was a spinning neutron star emitting radiation like a lighthouse and so thinking of when we try to think of what what's something that the physical universe couldn't what's something that couldn't naturally occur and then we go look for that thing we find a new parameter space of naturally occurring weird physics yes
Yes, so magnetars are, oh, the, the question was uh, about the types of emission that magnetars make and how they relate to neutron stars. Is that correct? So magnetars are a specific type of neutron star, and a neutron star is the remnant that's left behind after a very massive star has burned up all of its fuel and, ex and, and goes out in a giant explosion. What's left behind is a dense core of neutrons that's so dense it's almost like one big atomic nucleus. And often these are highly magnetized and often they're emitting uh, bright radiation out of their magnetic poles. If they are spinning around an axis that isn't that magnetic pole, then you see a beam of radiation sweep by like a lighthouse every time it passes by, and that's a pulsar. Uh, normally, the, the energy that's being emitted comes from something, you can calculate how much energy it should be emitting by noticing that you have something spinning very fast and it's slowing down, so it's losing energy, and that is the energy source that it's emitting. Some of them are emitting too much energy for that to be the explanation. And the energy source that we understand for those objects is that they have a lot of energy in their magnetic fields, and those are the magnetars. So they're a specific subclass of neutron stars. Yes? So the question relates to the orbit of Planet 9 and how far away the planet, uh, an orbit of a planet could be. So we have something called directly imaged planets, so planets that are actually just pictures are taken of them. And there are hundreds of AU, that was the, I think the, I want to say 600 AU kind of thing. There are a couple hundred AU from their host star. They can be up to that. And it depends on the star. Uh, the gravitational well of the star is going to depend on how massive the star is. For one, but yeah, I mean that's perfectly within the re the region of you know gravitational pull of the host of our sun, so yeah. Does the, does the, <laughs> does the size of the Oort cloud sort of represent like the boundaries of the gravitational influence of our star? Gravitational well. Uh, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the radius of the Oort cloud is on the order. Of, is I'm sorry, I'm asking, <laughs> is it on the order of several? So there's a difference between where a planet can form and where a planet can be in its gravitational pull of a host star. So when you have planets that are forming, um, what I'm talking about you know, for directly imaged planets, the planets that are kind of the furthest out from what we've seen mostly um, with respect to the distance from their star, uh, where a planet can form is very different than where it can be. So the gravitational pull of a host star can be much further out. But the problem is that planets form in a disk that surrounds the star. You need to have enough material to form those planets. So something like Planet 9, if it was captured by, from another star, then yeah, it could be at the outer boundary of where the host star, of where our sun can pull in. But I think that's an important nuanced issue is that where a planet can form and where a planet is found aren't the same thing necessarily. So I guess the answer is it depends pretty much. of uh, what I think is realistic for a planet that formed from our own uh, protostellar disk. Yes. <laughs> and strictly speaking, the gravitational influence of an object, gravity is an inverse square law, so it falls off with the square of the distance, but that extends to infinity. So if you had just like a single star in the universe and nothing else except this planet, it could be arbitrarily long distance away and actually be orbiting around. But that isn't realistic because there's a lot of other massive objects in the, in the vicinity that'll steal it away or perturb it so it wouldn't actually orbit. So mine is just like a technical point. That's their, their answer is the, the right answer. Uh, just, what's the 
what's the size of the heliosphere that it has around the Earth? Uh, the question is, what size is the heliosphere in astronomical units? Uh, well, Voyager just got outside the heliosphere, and I don't know how far away Voyager is. Uh, P, the PI of Voyager is in this building. Probably not right now. Ed Stone is probably sleeping. But um, yeah, it's on. It's in a few. It's it's in the hundreds, I think. I don't actually know the actual distance. Do you know, Mike? About one hundred. Okay, about a hundred AU. Well, just because you're outside the heliosphere, that, that's just the, the region that the magnetic field of the solar system is more powerful than the, than the surrounding uh, interplanet or, uh, interstellar magnetic field, so it's getting buffeted by the ISM and so on and so forth. So it doesn't mean that objects can't exist out there and still feel the gravitational influence of the, of the sun. It just means that it's not shielded by the magnetic field. Right, the, exactly, yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to steal planet questions from you guys. Carbon's kind of unique. Um, so the bonding, in, the bonding environments that carbon is capable of, uh, that carbon is capable of assuming um, are conducive to um, the assembly of these important structural molecules like lipids, carbs, et cetera. Um, if you substitute in something uh, like silicon, uh, which is, you know, one of the exciting and fun, uh, uh, it's, you know, they, if you've ever looked at a periodic table, the periodic table very nicely lays out like, oh, here, are, uh, here is our attempt at organi organizing elements in a way that uh, explains some of the similarities in the bonding environments that they're capable of taking up. Um, so silicon is one of these that people say like, oh, well, this is similar enough to carbon that we can substitute in. but. Uh, Functionally, uh, the nature of those bonds, if you start trying to make uh, the same kinds of bonds that you do with carbon um, using silicon, you end up with rocks instead, um, which, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, don't necessarily um, fit the, uh, the definition of life uh, that, we were talking, that we were talking about earlier. Um, so there, carbon is, definitely the best, um, the best element that we have for assembling biolog uh, biologically relevant structures. Um, and because it is the best, even th if you could substitute in some others, uh, those others would not be stable enough um, or as effective at, se at perpetuating themselves. And so that is one of the other criteria for life is that they're able to um, perpetuate themselves. And so the, the reason that we have some of the ubiquitous structures that we have, the reason why all living things use DNA is because it's that much more stable um, and that much more uh, robust um, when you start polymerizing it and making increasingly long sequences than um, it's, uh, than the related mo molecule RNA, for example. Um, and so it persists as our primary way of transferring um, uh, of storing the plans to assemble biological material and transferring that um, to it, our progeny. So carbon has become, so there's a reason that all life is carbon-based. There's a reason that um, all life uses DNA. There's a reason that all life uses these structural lipids. Um, and it's because they're the most, they win out kind of in a competition of who is the best at, who is the best at doing this thing and perpetuating itself. So it, it's weird because I'm using some of the language of evolution and natural selection um, to talk about the molecules themselves and not necessarily uh, something intentional that a living thing is trying to do to survive. Um, but the, 
I think that the language still translates well from the one to the other. And indeed, one of the things that, um, one of the important parts of astrobiology is not just the search for life on other worlds, but also the understanding of the origins of life. Um, and so before you have a cell, before you're assembling complex biological structures, you're just trying to assemble molecules that are effective at sticking around for long enough to make more of themselves. Um, and carbon compounds are really good at that. I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? Yeah. No, yeah. So there have been some attempts experimentally to create uh, molecules with similar structures um, to um, DNA and structural proteins um, using nitrogen mostly uh, are the experiments that I'm familiar with. Um, and uh, I feel like arsenic too arsenic-based life is something that people have also done experiments with. Um, so it is possible to uh, massage energetic uh, conditions to make uh, some of these molecules um, structurally stable um, and to get them to mimic some of the uh, functions of uh, important biomolecules on our own planet. Um, but a lot of those conditions are not necessarily, uh, I won't say that they aren't naturally occurring, um, because obviously with the range of planet um, that we've been talking about around other stars, and you know, y you could maybe alter a lot of things about the geological history of a world in order to, yeah, yeah. Um, you've got to be a lot colder for one, I think, in order to get like the, um, nitrogenous, um, like, yeah, nitrogenous, like, protein-like structures in order to, uh, to stabilize them. So there, there are some experiments doing that, um, which I think is super interesting um, and certainly expands our view of um, uh, possible stories for the origin of life possibly around other planets. Um, but at this point, it's um, pretty purely speculative because we haven't observed such an environment where those things could be sustained. It's a, it's a very popular idea though for um, the planet uh, Titan, um, or sorry, I say the planet Titan, the, the world Titan, the moon Titan, um, one of the other extremely large and extremely popular moons um, in our solar system. Um, it's the only other body um, in the solar system that has liquid oceans at its surface. Um, but it's much, much farther out um, from the sun than Earth is, so those oceans, instead of being made of water, are made of, um, well, mostly methane and ethane and interesting complex hydrocarbons and things like that. Um, so it's a lot colder, um, and that's a place where maybe carbon, because carbon compounds are sort of forming the basis for the equivalent uh, rock or ices on that world, then maybe carbon's not the best molecule for um, as the basis for a biosphere. So maybe it's nitrogen instead. And so that was sort of, I think, the motivation or ethos uh, behind, some of, behind some of those experiments. Yeah. Yeah, which is very interesting. Though the, you know, the whole range of interesting consequences for the, the climate and weather systems on, on a hydrocarbon, uh, Facsimile of Earth are, uh, you know, it's it's a very fascinating and rich field of study. That is not my own, but. <laughs> Sorry, unfortunately, it is ten past ten, and I'm about to pass out <laughs> because I have to be back here at nine for this Science for March thing. So, thank you all for sticking around. Thank you all for coming. I hope you got something out of both the panel as well as the stargazing and Mike's talk. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to come to one of our other events. We have the next public lecture on the schedule up front, April 12th, on the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the next Astronomy on Tap in a week and a half. 
on black holes and very large numbers. So thank you all for coming.